Thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to our podcast. This is I Compete, Building Your Empire with John Hewitt, live from the castle. Hi, I'm Roberta Barrett. I'm John Hewitt's producer. You might be asking, who is John Hewitt? Well, he is the Hewitt in Jackson Hewitt Tax Services. If you want to find out more about John Hewitt and what he's currently doing, go to loyaltybrands.com. That's loyaltybrands.com. Or find John T. Hewitt on LinkedIn or Facebook. John Hewitt's made over a thousand millionaires and you could be the next one. Here is your host, John Hewitt. Thank you, Roberta. Today we have a special guest, uh, Bob Gappa. He's, uh, as I tease him all the time, he's the second most experienced person in franchising. And Bob, why don't you tell us about yourself and prove that to, to us? <laughs> well, thanks, John. Uh, over the last 41 years, we focused on uh, helping companies that use franchising as the primary strategy to grow their brand to do that. Uh, and a lot of times companies that want to grow a brand using franchising uh, are attracted to franchising, but they don't really know much about it. And so like you, uh, I've learned some things that can help them and some systems. And so we've worked with over 600 or 1,650 brands over 41 years, and uh, two of them have been years, and now we're working with you again, and it's uh, a real privilege, and I enjoy these conversations whenever we can have them, so thanks. Thank you, and, and from my experience, my uh, 52 years of experience in this industry, uh, 1,615 is, is a wow, a big wow. I don't, I don't know of anyone that's ever even done, even consulted with 300, let alone 1,650. So that's an amazing, amazing feat. Congratulations. And, and we're so pleased to have you on the call. Thanks, Chuck. Let's, uh, today you wanted to talk about, about uh, leadership versus management. And yes, sir. I'm going to give you one, I'm going to give you my experience first, because you're the, you're like the professor and I'm like the maverick, entrepreneur, uh, CEO that founds companies. And, and so I'm going to tell you the way that I think of leadership versus management, at least from this vantage point. And, uh, I'll start by saying that people have asked me, uh, constantly, why are you, why are you successful? Why do you think you've achieved, achieved so much? And, and how do you build companies? And I give them a different answer for franchising versus overall, but, but one of the two, or number one or two most critical components is that I've been able to convince all the stakeholders, all the stakeholders to believe in my vision. And so my, my impression of, of great leadership is you have to have the ability to have a vision that's pretty accurate. That's, and you have to be able to get everyone to buy into it. You have to get your, employees, your franchisees, your customers, your vendors, you have to get everyone to buy into that vision. And that's what true leadership is. And, and I think that, that so often that's missing in, in management. And, uh, you know, I call it the suits, the people come in and take over for entrepreneurs. I call them the suits. So, um, having said that, and having said what my, my thought is on, on leadership, uh, Go ahead. Tell us. Tell us the difference, because I would get. I would bet that that most of the listeners, if not all the listeners, don't really know the the difference between leadership and management. Uh, the way the the most simplistic way that that I can put it without defining the two is leadership has to do with the dynamics of the organization, the people side, and getting that right, uh, learning and development. Management has to do with the processes that the people use to contribute to and achieve the vision. And uh, leadership influences people. John, I think one of the things I'd like you to talk about, because it's really misunderstood, is delegation and how delegation really creates an ownership mentality and an ownership mentality creates accountability for results and that is what Drucker would call the ability for people to have the contribution ethics 
how can I contribute to the achievement of the vision that you've just so really eloquently described leadership in a very, very practical way that I appreciate. Uh, and, and I'd like you to, because I know I'm reading your book, it's a big part of leadership is delegation. And, and most people think, I think delegation is assigning tasks to people. And I don't think you do. Would you do me a favor and talk about Sure, delegation. sure. Before I do, can I ask you one simple, simple one word question is, is delegation leadership or management? I think it's both. Wow. Okay. I think you delegate accountability, uh, and you give people the, or you give them leeway to design the process to achieve the result that they're accountable for. Yeah, let me say how I feel about delegation. It's, it's first of all, it's one of the two or three biggest diseases of, of management that, I, that I've seen people, people um, just, uh, most people are incapable of, of yeah. uh, delegation. In fact, uh, I, you know, I brought in 5,000 franchisees in my career, and, and most of them, at least 80 or 90% of them, had wanted to have multiple offices. And... What I've seen is that only about a third of them can do a good job with multiple offices. So if if the person they're delegating to is out of sight, if they're not in the same office, they're just totally incapable of, of delegation because it's it's just such a fine skill. And so in what I've learned is that if a franchisee can run two offices, they can run four, they can run eight, they can run 10, they can run 12, but some of them fall back and can only run one office. So, and, and people, people don't understand the, the most important part of delegation. And I constantly give this quiz out and people get it wrong, but I'm not going to quiz you because I'm not going to take a chance in you getting it wrong. Um, and not that you would, but um, may, you, maybe you'll tell me that I'm wrong, but um, it's easy to tell people what to do. It's easy to say, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. And the toughest thing, though, is the reason people fail at delegation is they they uh, have a failure to check the results on an ongoing basis. And and you don't wait until the end of a project. If if you're having a give someone a task, and it's going to be make a hundred calls. And for example, one of the things that we do different in our brands than in other industries or other competitors in in all industries is we call our customers and ask them how we did for them and uh, that's a, about a five minute call we ask them how we did we uh, if they're happy and they generally are we ask them for referrals we ask them how they heard about us and we invite them to come back and uh, i exaggerate it's more like three minutes so we have we have a call with each and every customer and the, but yet when I teach someone to do that the first time and I give them a list, I don't give them a list of here, go call 500 people because they could screw up, screw it up 500 times. After the first 10, I say, go call 10 people, bring me the results and then we'll discuss it. And then they get that right. And that I always, almost always have to modify it a little bit. And then I say, go call 10 more people. And it's so you don't wait until the, the end of the project to find out that someone screwed it up. And uh, so I think the, 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 um, the key to delegation from my experience is you have to inspect your expectations. Well, once again, uh, my definitions are very much compatible with yours, even though I might use a little bit different language. You're, you're really on um, on track, and I have never shared this with you, I don't think, but I look at franchising as legalized delegation because we give people a business model to follow, and we give them accountability for that business model, and we say, look, we own all of the farmland in the United States, so to speak, which is the area that we legally can uh, franchise. And we're giving you this piece of dirt, so to speak, the territory that they have to operate in, and we're giving them a tool shed 
and we're giving them the training on the tools in the tool shed, and we give them a process of when to plant and how to cultivate. And if they use the tools in the tool shed, they're going to be successful, but most people don't for whatever reason. And what you've described is the process of delegation where you don't let go immediately with everything, but you let people achieve small successes and then you give them more and then you give them more until you can trust them to do what you want them to do with large numbers of people. And uh, that's the genius that you've learned over the years of what delegation is. It's a process of letting go in increments that the person can handle so that they achieve success when they're being delegated to. But eventually, they're accountable for everything, and you don't have to check very often. But yes, in the beginning, you do because you want them to succeed. It's not that you're looking for them to fail. You want them to succeed. A really good description, John, of delegation. Thanks. Let me tell you how I taught one of my... my um favorite employees of all time. She was a, uh, in charge of, she was director of uh, technical support. So when the franchisees called in with questions, uh, uh, computer questions, we, her team would, would answer the questions. And, and I was just frustrated with her because I couldn't teach her to delegate. She did everything. She couldn't, she couldn't let go. And, and she knew she was supposed to, she acknowledged verbally that she was supposed to, but I got, I got really lucky one time. I, it was, this is 1989. I walked over to, she, she had a team of about a dozen people working and there she was at the copier, uh, copying, copying documents. And so I, I actually needed some, it was, it was perfect timing because I needed something copied. So I went to one of her people and I said, could you make copies of this for me? And they went over to her and almost elbowed her, elbowed her out of the way and said, John needs copies. And so he gave me, and then he came over and brought me my copies. And it was just an incredible lesson for her that what was she doing? Right. That, yeah. that, that and, and I think she understood that there wasn't a chance in a million that I would be at that copy machine with 14 employees there that I would stand at that copy machine making copies and it all of a sudden it, it, it hit, uh, you know, it, it, uh, she got it. Uh, she went up to become a, a vice president of, of, uh, uh, at that company, Jackson Hewitt. And then she went on to, uh, become a vice president at another franchise, uh, something like Molly made or something else in the future. So she had a great career and, uh, she learned delegation on that, in that few seconds in 1989. So, when, when you say she got it, in quotes, my feeling is, my observation is that you taught her how to think better than she did before. And if that's true, part of, I suppose, academic definition of leadership is what I think you do very well, which is teach people how to think rather than have thoughts. You help people to connect the dots like you do on a chessboard. And that's hard to do. But your life is dedicated to changing people. And I think that what you've done in, in creating two companies that have thousands of locations is you can't do that if you're not teaching people how to think correctly about how to do what needs to be done to achieve the results that need to be accomplished. And I think you do that. And I think you do it consciously. And I think more people need to do it consciously. Yeah. I'm, I'm constantly lecturing people and, and I, to the, to the point that, that some people would think I'm a nuisance. Um, but at the end of the day, I think they, they understand the value of, of the lessons that I provide. And, you know, I learned a long time ago that, that when you, when you teach children, you can lecture to them, but you, when you teach adults, you need to, it needs to have interaction. So today here's, here's an example of, of one of the messages today in another vein. Uh, this isn't related to delegation, but it's a, related to teaching. The last 
sentence of an email that one of my new employees sent out. It says, it is not possible for me to provide this information. And what he was really doing is complaining about others in the company that weren't cooperating. And, Mm -hmm. and so I sent him, I said, I called him in and said, that's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. And, and so he said, Oh yeah, I get it. And looking at it again, it's negative. And I said, well, well, how would you, well, tell me how to fix it. And he said, okay, here's two strikes, three strikes. He, he gave a couple of times and he didn't get it yet. And he was still coming at a negative vantage point. And, and I try to have, you know, our, 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 uh, uh, our principles are just say yes and positive attitude. And this is not a positive attitude. Is so? Is there a way to say that in a possible in a positive way? And so he came back, and he finally got an acceptable. I gave him a, he was acceptable, but the, the, what I wanted him to come back with, and what I wanted him to say was, these are the tools I need. This is the help I need in order to achieve my goals. That's all he had to say, right? This this is mm-hmm. what this is what I need to achieve my goals. And I need to know that the list, I need the the phone number of each of the five attorney firms. And he just needed to say, this is what I need to achieve my goals that you never say this is impossible, right? Everything's possible. So, um, it's, so I'm constantly, um, um, applying that in every interaction I have with, with my uh, team. I even do that in, in, uh, public when I meet someone and, and, you know, I, I don't know if I wrote about that in the first book, but, but oftentimes I meet strangers and I'm giving them advice on, um, on even if they say something to me, like to tell the truth. And I will say, always, <laughs> always I'll say, um, is this the first time you tell me the truth? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other thing that people do because they hedge their bets is use uh, adverbs and adjectives instead of. Uh, just making statements that are inclusive of what they really mean. Uh, but using the word teaching uh, and principles, uh, oftentimes companies list their principles or they might call them their values, but they never teach anybody how to think about those. And and people, just because there's a principle sitting there, doesn't mean they know how to think about it. And I think that you're always a teacher, helping people understand how to think about and make connections between things so that in the future, they'll be more efficient and effective at getting the results they want. Uh, You help people get rid of the clutter. uh, And that's part of leadership to me is focus, contribution. Uh, Being, I know it's always funny to me to to remember and not funny ha-ha, but funny strange and important. Drucker said the most underutilized time management technique is saying no. Because if I do that, I'll help you, but I won't be able to achieve my results. Now, is there some way you can get that done? Because I know you want to, but I can't be distracted uh, from doing that. Yeah. I'm so jealous of my time. I'm, I'm just, I know. I, I'm, I'm just annoying to know it. I mean, people ask me questions. They send me an email. They ask me a question that I, I don't, I try never to answer a question that, that 10 other people know in the company. Right. And people will say, and, and even, even some of my uh, former franchisees from other companies and friends, and, and they'll say, so when is, when is that? Or, or one of them, for example, sent in and said, can you recommend the name of an attorney and, or an attorney? And so I sent in, that I sent, I, I kindly gave them the a recommendation. And then they said, can you give me the contact information? <laughs> and I just said, and right? I mean, I would have to Google it. Why can't they Google it? Anyway, the beauty of <laughs> the beauty of Google is I don't have to do their work for them anymore. Right. They can, if they can Google yeah. it, they shouldn't be asking me. Or if, if I write them something and they, and I use a word that they're not familiar with and they say, what does this mean? I laugh out loud because like, I'm going to go They're They're giving me work. And I tell people, you're not allowed to give me work. But back to, we started this with leadership and management. I don't, and, and I, your, 
your definition was very textbook. And to me, um, um, it really doesn't matter the, to me, what the words mean. And to me, it's what the concepts mean. And we've, mm-hmm. we've talked a lot about, about leadership, but management to me is, is about um, handling people. And while I, I consider myself as an extraordinary leader, I'm, I'm, I feel that I'm an ordinary manager because um, it's there. Talk about the duties and the responsibilities of management. And uh, before you do that, um, is it, is it common that, that most people are either one or the other, either a leader Uh, or a manager? I mean, if they can, they might be neither, but if the, is it common that, that people aren't both of them? I think it's very uncommon that, that people are both of them. The, the personally, I prefer the active word managing results to opposed to management. Because to me, management is the ability to be constantly able to managing results. Leadership to me is influence. Uh, anybody can influence somebody else if they want to. Uh, I uh, I always remember the uh, the story in the in the scripture where a person was healed because they simply touched the uh, end of the garment that uh, that Christ was wearing. And to me, if I secularize that, it means that a leader is always influencing people, whether they know it or not, by the, what they do and how they do it, for good or ill. And and so, in a very practical sense the way I treat somebody in a grocery store in line, if they have one item and I have 30 and I say, go ahead of me, I'm influencing them. The way I let people in on the freeway influences them, good or bad. And so leadership to me is is influencing people with my intent, which is to make them a better person because of, of, uh, of my behavior, whether that's inside a company or inside a family or wherever it is. Management is managing is the process I use to do that. And in a company, uh, that's the business model we give people in franchising that we constantly have to improve. And uh, in a family, it's the it's anything you want it to be. But what I'm saying is there's processes that get better results than other. And if you make them up spontaneously, it's probably not as good as if you plan it out. So I think very few people really understand managing results. Uh, and I think very few people understand leadership as influence. I've never considered this before. So I'll, I'll throw it to you as a question first on a scale of one to 10, uh, you're thinking of people, adults, uh, what do they think of the word leadership as a positive versus management? In general, on a, scale okay, of one to ten. What, what, well, is that unfair? I yeah. caught you off guard. So. Yeah, no, no. Am I yeah. comparing the two, or am yeah. I dealing with? Um, you're just saying in and when you say if if a, if someone tells you that that person's a leader, uh, what kind of um, or uh, how do you look at leaders in general? How do you look at leaders? And someone say, what do you think of management? Is it, 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 there? Is it clear that one word is more powerful and positive than the other? Yes. And which is that? Leadership. And, and is it? I think. Uh, oh, go ahead. No, go go ahead. Ask me your follow up. Is it? My my question was: Is management even get a fifty percent? I mean, it seems to me like no. a, a dirty word almost. It does. Yeah. Management means I get, I don't have any input on what I'm doing and you're imposing it on me. I think that's sort of a general definition and I don't like to be managed like a horse doesn't like to be managed. People think, but uh, no, I, I think it's sure it gets short shrift. I don't think it's understood uh, until somebody runs a red light and, and T-bones you and you don't die. And then you realize management's a good thing. Having processes to follow is good. It gets better results, but yeah, I think it gets short shrift. Yeah, I would. I mean, I would say that um, if I if someone told me that that person's a leader, I would think, oh, that's like an eight or a nine. And if they said, oh, the, oh, management, 
word management or micromanagement or any of that, I'm thinking that's a four. I mean, I just, no, I'm just not a fan of management, especially with, you know, I've had being, being a, a uh, supervisor leader for decades and decades, I've had so much staff and so many, I mean, when we peaked at, at my last two companies, we had, when we, when we went for a management retreat, quote management retreat, we would have 40 people there. And, and so I had 40 managers and it was what one, and there was many frustrations, including the lack of delegation, but one, one frustration is the inability to measure results over activities. Everyone wanted to, everyone wanted to measure activities. No one wanted to go to results. I had, I had supervisors. I had a CFO that looked out the window to see what time employees came in. They made sure they were in by nine o'clock. I mean, a CFO of a public company. That's, that's just insane. That's, that's why the two word term that I prefer is managing results rather than management. Because I do believe that a lot of people think it deals with activities, and it doesn't. It's like people think delegation is assigning a project when it's really assigning ownership to something, to a result. If you're a great delegator, could you, and you assign properly, could the results be, could the, could the other person add value, add, add value and make it a better process? Absolutely. One would hope so. Two heads are better than one, right? And and uh, yeah. that's that's one of the the one of the great things about about uh, teamwork and yeah. and leadership and training is that you give people the results you want them to achieve, and you give them training. But then go go get the results, and the, you're gonna sometimes and may not be often depends how experienced you are, but sometimes they're gonna come back with a with value added and a better way to do it and something you hadn't thought about. You, you always, and I mean always, give people the opportunity to think about something that they've asked you before you give your opinion because you want them to demonstrate to you to what extent they're thinking about it versus to what extent they want you to answer their questions for them. Uh, you know, the example you gave earlier uh, made me recall a, a COO I reported to, and I came to him once and I, I asked his opinion on something, and he said, I know what you're doing is wanting me to solve this for you, So, and I know I can, and so if I do solve it for you, and I'll give you a chance to, to take back your request, but if I do solve it for you, what part of your paycheck do I get next time? And I walked out. Well, that's sort of like and he me. meant it. Yeah. He he meant it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of my favorite um, thoughts. Is if uh, we both think the same, one of us is useless. Yes, I and, love that. And and since I'm the CEO, guess, guess who I'm going to pick is useless. So I want <laughs> I want people to disagree, but but I've learned, and I talked about this earlier that. That if you give a lecture, if you tell an adult something, they're not going to learn half as much or a quarter as much as if you let them think about it. And yep. even if they come to the wrong conclusion, they've thought about it. They put they put thought processes in their mind. And and I found that the older I've gotten, the less uh, the the less people want to think for themselves. People have lazy brains. So we need to end it here. And uh, thank you for your time. But we'll get into that another day about uh, people with lazy brains. Well, I also though okay. I also have to say that you did you did comment that you like to teach people how to think at the end. So yay! <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you again. All right. All right. Bye. Thank you for taking the time to learn about how to build your empire with John Hewitt. Find John on LinkedIn at John T. Hewitt or message John Hewitt on Facebook. This is I Compete, live from the castle, building your empire with John Hewitt.
Don't miss new episodes every Monday by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, cpnshows.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Until next time, this was I Compete, building your empire with John Hewitt.